Good morning. I'm travel writer and travel perspective co-founder Mark Frary and with my colleague Steve Keenan we've been putting on these travel perspective sessions at World Travel Market for 10 years now which seems quite hard to believe. Uh, over that time we've heard from the heads of travel at some of the world's big tech companies such as Facebook, Google and Twitter. We've heard the stories of some of the most exciting startups in travel and the best connected travel influencers as well as marketing thought leaders in travel. Now, it goes without saying that things are a little different in 2020. For the past seven months, the world has been missing travel, forced to stay at home and to do things virtually rather than experiencing them in person. Travel from being a contributor of 10% of the world's GDP and sporting hundreds of millions of jobs worldwide, it's become one of the world's biggest startups, having to be far more agile in what it does. And everyone is now having to live the mantra, dream now, travel later although one of my panelists is joining us from Greece today, so maybe he, he's traveling now. So in, in today's session, we're gonna be looking at what we've been searching for while in lockdown, how we're adapting to change, whether there are psychological effects of not traveling for those who love it, and what we're all gonna be looking forward to when things get back to normal. So I'm delighted to be joined today by a panel that I can only describe as eclectic. Linda Blair is a chartered clinical psychologist and an associate fellow of the British Psychological Society. She writes regular advice columns for a number of editorial publications, including The Guardian and The Daily Telegraph. She's an expert in stress management. And just to be clear, for those of an older vintage, she's not the girl with a head turning performance in the movie The Exorcist. Uh, Patrick Johnson is CEO and chairman of Hybrid Theory, an ad tech business that focuses on how to solve macro business problems through advertising. Patrick has extensive experience working with both brands and agencies, and Patrick was previously a global commercial director with advertising titan WPP. And he assures me that uh, there's no Lincoln Park um, lover in his company, hence the name of it. And last but not least, we're joined by Nikki Kelvin, who's director of content for and the face of the Points Guy UK, the UK arm of the global travel brand with millions of monthly visitors seeking advice on travel and particularly loyalty programs. Nikki oversees the creation of UK focused content and he spent years as a record label lawyer, so he knows all about Lincoln Park, hopefully. He's also an avid traveler, sharing his tips about points and miles under the guise of Miles Mogul. So, welcome to you all. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. So um, taking it in turn, um, Linda, lockdown and the pandemic has been very, very tough for some people. And I wonder if you could talk to us about that and then going beyond that, about why people feel the need to travel, the effects on mental health and well well-being when you, you're actually not allowed to, to travel, as many of us have not been able to do for the past few months. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's affected some of us. I think this pandemic has affected everybody. Um, and we're only just beginning to get some of the, um, the more distressing reactions because when something so sudden and so catastrophic happens, well, we've never had anything like it, what human beings do is go into shock. Don't feel a thing. And your whole being is about preserving yourself and helping others because that's what makes humans survive. So at the beginning, you remember every Thursday we're waving to the NHS and we're all going to uh, do everything in our own house and redecorate and everything's going to be fine. But the problem is that after uh, a relenting period of this high, uh, high um, cortisol, which is the chemical that makes us cope, um, you get tired and then the emotions leak through. And what we're getting now is the real result of this pandemic anxiety, uh, depressed mood. Some people are depressed. We've had higher suicide rates. It's, it's dreadful and it's only just unfolding because it's gonna take a while to repair. And in particular, I'm uh, thinking of you who are travel agents because um, of all the sectors, I think you're one of the most um, unsure right now of what your future is. And um, that causes further anxiety, never mind the, the threat of the virus. You know, you've got that in addition. Um, to me, there are really three things that uh, 
go wrong when we can't travel. One is that, well, I call it CHC because I always like to have little ways to remember things. But the, the first thing is we're deprived of change. And in ordinary circumstances, that's, um, that's a shame. But right now, with most of us at least mildly sensorily deprived, this is terrible. So we're, our brain is like the muscle we're not using, the cortex, and it's, it's desperate to get some stimulation, to get some new ideas, to have a reason to connect up some new thoughts. So that's one of the main things we're missing by, by not traveling, because, of course, traveling makes you think new, think fresh, think different. Um, the, the, the second thing is that we um, have some wonderful habits not just bad habits, but some wonderful habits that we are deprived of. Um, I go to Greece <laughs> every year or um, in the summer, I always travel to Spain or whatever. And that's denied us. So instead we're stuck with doing the same things over and over again. And those habits don't look so attractive when we have to keep doing them. So there's this habit denial. Um, and then uh, finally, the, 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 I think the most important thing and the most distressing thing for all of us is we've lost control. Now, we never had it, but for a, a good 30, 40 years now, we've been able to, well, more than that, really, we've been able to fool ourselves that we do. So we make plans and we expect them to happen. Um, I don't suppose any of us are ever going to take that for granted again. Um, but it does throw up the one thing that I think we can do above all else right now to, to trigger the joy of travel when we can. And that is just what Mark said himself a little while ago, dream. Um, there's a lot of solid research which shows that the most um, happiest time of a holiday is the planning. <laughs> <laughs> that's better than the actual experience unless absolutely nothing goes wrong. And how many of you had a travel experience where absolutely nothing went wrong? So rather than call it planning, um, my feeling is we should call it dreaming um, because we can't plan the dates, but I'm not very good with business and thank God the other two I'm sure are. But the, the idea that occurred to me psychologically is the one thing the travel industry could do, I think, to keep their industry more alive psychologically is to be as flexible as you possibly can with actually setting dates. So people could dream about their trip to Gibraltar that they've always wanted to take or their safari in Africa. But um, you would guarantee that um, you will book it within some kind of window once we can. And that way, people, I think, will still keep hitting the sites and keep looking and keep dreaming and keep preparing for that chance to travel. I think that's enough for me, don't you? <laughs> Thanks for that, Linda. Um, I was going to ask you about this. because I remember reading some research a, a, a while back about... Um, military people being um, on call ready to go into action and how um, often you know they they won't keep soldiers uh, ready for action longer than about two weeks before it starts actually having serious mental health effects on those people because it's you know the lack of knowing what's about to happen it actually has a really a really damaging effect and I, and I just wonder if that same sort of thing is going on with us because all of us are in this position of of not knowing exactly what's going to happen I mean here in the UK I mean we have you know constantly changing rules about what we can and cannot do and you know obviously is that having that same sort of effect on us? Unfortunately you're absolutely right uh, two weeks is is uh, safe uh, for the military but actually we can go for about six weeks with uncertainty but after that that's why I said the the feelings are, are breaking through now have broken through and all that distress is there because um, we produce a number of chemicals in our brain that, that do us well uh, in short bursts but don't do us well chronically and cortisol is the main problem, which is the one that keeps us checking. Where's the danger? Where is the problem? And um, it's exhausting. And when you go off cortisol, people who've had to do have steroids know what this feels like. You crash a and you crash very dramatically. And, and it's, it's really hard to, to keep going. 
Um, you've heard the phrase post-traumatic stress disorder. I, I think for some people, we're going to see that it's that bad because it's gone on that long. You said one other thing, constantly changing. Well, no, that's the bad thing. If we knew every day it was going to be different, it'd be easier than what we know now, which is that it might be okay today, but it might change next week. You know, that's the awful thing. Well, Patrick, I'd like to come to you now. Um, I mean, you're, you're a Kiwi. Um, yep. <laughs> Kiwi's known for loving travel. I mean, have you been missing travel in this lockdown, would you say? Absolutely, and trying to fit it in as and when I could. I mean, you know, whether it's sort of domestic and getting away for, um, from things. And, and uh, uh, certainly I've just got back from Greece as well, so I managed to sneak in a, in a short one there. But it's, it's all been about adaptability and flexibility to the environment we're in. I mean, everything is changing, and, and we interact with pretty much every different sector out there. And we've seen shifts in both buying behavior, attributes people are looking at, you know, international to domestic, um, the, 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 the changes in sort of bargain shopping versus just wanting to go away. And it's almost doesn't matter. Um, so all of these shifts are going on at one time. And what we did is um, for our clients, I mean, traditionally we've built using uh, our audience knowledge graph for digital marketing and targeting. But we, uh, we sort of went to our clients and said, what do you need? And far more, we are just almost, almost sort of in a watch list mode of reading all of the different markets and how consumer behavior is changing, where opportunism comes in and where there are sort of short-term um, opportunities. And then when uh, behavior needs to change again and spending shouldn't be there at all. Uh, and then what new consumer profiles they look like for, for a different client. So it's, it's all moving rapidly all the time. So in terms of uh, what people are searching for, and not, not necessarily in the psychological terms, as, as Linda has discussed, but, you know, what people are typing into search engines about travel. I mean, can you give us any sort of insight in, into that and whether that's changed at all over, over the pan pandemic? They have. I mean, in, in travel, it's, it's a tough one. So search engines are generally encrypted, so you, so you can't get them directly from the search engines. You can get them from the search bars on websites. So we get everything that's in a, in a search box on a website, everything that people are browsing and everything that people are posting to the various social media sites. So um, certainly the length of, of travel has shortened quite considerably. So people are looking at short-term um, engagements, a lot more domestic, which none of that should come as a surprise. Um, and in travel, we've seen lots of micro things going on. So no great big sweeping trends where you could sort of in the past say, here are core behaviors, here are core personas, and they all kind of move in a similar fashion. We're seeing lots of a, a, a massive fragmentation of that. And so there are there is really not a lot of consistency going on at all, which is where that opportunism comes in. Um, you know, if you take, we also uh, interact with the tech sector. And so we have seen far more group trending going on. You know, no surprises, people looking at working from home and, and looking at gaming and all sorts of other things like that. But in the travel sector, it's been micro situations all over the place. Um, as I said, far more weekends, far more domestic travel would be the two core things, but you know, that, that won't come as a surprise to anyone or anybody, I wouldn't think. And um, I mean, you talked about short term there. I mean, presumably there's a short term influence there as well in terms of booking as well, because, you know, as we mentioned with, with Linda, you know, there's the, constantly changing rules. You, you never know whether Santorini, where Nikki is right now, is going to be on the safe list or not from the UK. And so, you know, we've seen that, you know, when these changes do happen, they, um, they lead to, you know, the pent up demand being released, you know, so we saw when the Canary Islands came off that list, for example, until obviously we went into national lockdown again, but, uh, you know, there was a surge in interest in, in that. Do you, do you see these behaviours happening in what you're looking at? Absolutely. So we get, um, all of our data comes in every two hours. And so it is reacting fast to everything that's going on. So as fast as it ramps up, it drops off as well. Um, so we're seeing all of those, those, those different changes. I think the biggest change that we're seeing is a move from much of the targeting in the past was, was broad and was demographically based and was in fairly saturated environments like you know, Google's and Facebook's of the world. And what we've sort of seen is clients trying to eke out 
where there are differences related to their brand um, from their competitors, far more so, which is where the behavioral side of things comes in. So we're getting behavioral data. Um, and, and once again, it comes down to those micro pockets. There has also been a correlation domestically, far more with other interests. So people who, sporting's gone out the window primarily for everybody. And so that used to be, used to have quite a big sporting travel sector, but certainly things like weekend escapes, um, dining um, has certainly started raising up quite heavily in, in terms of one of the crossovers, because I think people are missing both. They're missing both the travel, but they're also missing sort of having opportunities to sort of be together in that sort of environment. So it's that blending of the activities outside of travel that's become quite interesting and where the points of differentiation are. And generally, how are companies, travel companies, going to try and um, take advantage of what you've said there? I mean, these changing habits, how, how can they do that on a, you know, not, not just using you, obviously, but to sure. generally, how can you how can you tap into that ever-changing landscape and, you know, market to those people when demand eventually does come back? Um, I, I think it is a couple of different things. One is leaning into their partners. So, you know, the ones that we have seen successful are the ones who have been very open about the fact that, you know, what is going on. So there are plenty, we've got plenty of competitors and, and, and many of them are great as well. And so it's leaning into to whoever the, they are. Um, the other one is recognizing that this is such a seismic change mm -hmm. that everything that we knew a year ago um, it is unlikely to be the same after. And so you almost need to start again and sort of rebuild it from that perspective. Once again, it's where all the, 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 the different partners come in. So it's just recognizing that although there are pockets of consumers who have always been there that will be the same, it's recognizing that, that they will all need to change down the road. Nikki, if we can come to you now, I mean, you're obviously somebody who travels in, in enormous amounts. And uh, as we say, you're in Greece right now. Um, and, you know, you're, the points guy has obviously targeted that, that group of people who are travel addicts, you know, whether they are business travelers or, or leisure travelers. And, um, you, you know, many of those people, I mean, you know, you just talk to any, any business traveler and they're always sort of talking about how they can get to their next tier level on, on their executive club or advantage program or something like that and I just wonder if you can talk to us about you know how it has affected your readers and, and people generally who are travel addicts that you know that they're not able to travel and then then perhaps we can talk a little bit about changing behavior and how we might come out of it yeah so it's been incredibly interesting times because there's this very strange balance between people wanting to get away desperate for a break um, wanting their summer holiday and then also there may be miles and points activity that is going on alongside that. And actually, I'm guilty of this. And in a normal, in, in the olden days, my life was very much dictated by snagging that amazing deal or getting the most tier points or earning the most avios on a certain route. And I would end up finding myself in places, not because I decided to go to that certain place or on a certain date, but because I was chasing some kind of goal. Um, of course, that's completely flipped on its head now. And, and as Patrick said, people are, are sort of looking to go away in any way that they can just to be able to go away, be that a staycation or staying a bit closer to home, wh whatever it is, the places that were opening up. And, and we definitely saw shifts in where people were going, depending on where the government was allowing people to go without quarantining. So there were shifts there. But in the, in the loyalty world, it's been incredibly interesting. So some of the programs took a little a little longer to really offer up a lot to their members. And we've seen some really big strides, things that we never would have imagined to have seen before. So uh, we've seen airline programs really reduce the offering to their frequent flyers over the past few years, cutting um, the benefits, increasing the amount of points that you need to redeem hotels and, and flights. Um, and we've seen concessions, which is a big surprise. And these have been mainly in the form of big extensions. So it took BA a little while to do it, but in the end, they gave everybody a 12 month extension on their status and they reduced the amount of points that they needed to hit status by 30%. Virgin Atlantic did the same thing, 12 month extension. Lots of airlines around the world came steaming in early with these big extensions. Lots of hotel programs have done the same. But the big question is, are people really going to take advantage of these reduced thresholds or even be able to use that silver or gold membership with BA that they've built up because they can't actually 
go anywhere. Um, and right at the beginning of the pandemic, it's quite an interesting anecdote. There was a there was a mistake fare to Hawaii, and it was on Delta Air France and KLM, and it was four hundred dollars. Um, and Linda, you spoke about dreaming trips and dreaming, and this for me, going to Hawaii on a four hundred dollar ticket round trip in business class, earning more points than you could ever imagine, is the dream. And this carrot has been dangled in front of me and I, I booked it in, at the start of March for August. I was like, everything will be over by August. I'll be able to travel. I'll earn all my points, holding on to my old sort of miles and points earning value. Obviously August never happened. I changed it to November. It'll be fine by November. I'll definitely be able to go to Hawaii by then. Anyway, yesterday I just changed my flight again to March. It was the latest I could change it to because it's a year down the line. I could change it for free, but now I'm in a place where I almost feel anxious about the trip. I'm like, is it ever going to happen? Am I wasting my time? Do I just cut cut loose? But yet there's still that switch in my brain that's like, I know I'm going to earn 75,000 uh, virgin points and nearly a thousand tier points and I'm going to hit status again. So my brain is torn between these two things. And I know a lot of our readers have been torn between these two things throughout this pandemic as, as offers have popped up. Great. Um, I just want to sort of open it up a bit uh, to the audience. So uh, you'll see at the top right of your screen, there's a place you can ask questions. So please do submit as many of those as you possibly can. Um, we have some of our own questions, but um, I just, um, you know, Nikki, while you're on that point, though, I mean, do you think that uh, there will be availability? I mean, you know, anyone who collects loyalty points will come back to you and say, well, I know that, you know, it's always difficult to get um, a flight, for example, when you want it, unless you're really sort of switched on on these things. Do you think that's going to be even more difficult now to do that? As, uh, you know, because we've seen already that airlines are cutting their schedules, you know, they're sort of 25% of, of where they were. I mean, they will come back, hopefully. But, um, you know, the, the chances of actually using these points may even be much more difficult than in the past. Yeah, I think it's a really good question. There's two sides to it. I just want to tackle first the fact that this whole period over the past seven or eight months has actually been a great opportunity to earn points and almost impossible to spend them. It's been You've been able to spend them, but people haven't been able to actually go anywhere, so they haven't. And so we've seen incredible credit card deals where they've been doubling or tripling points on purchases at places like you know supermarkets. And people have been racking up points and and also shopping portals, lots of people have been doing, um, we talk about this at the Points Guy all the time, buy everything through a shopping portal and you'll earn multiples of six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 miles per pound that you spend. And everyone's been ordering everything online. So people are sitting on sometimes tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of points. And what we've seen over the past few months is that availability has been incredibly good. More award seats than ever before because planes are so empty. Now you need to balance that against what you just mentioned of reduced capacity and reduced scheduling. Now, capacity and scheduling is gonna go back up as demand increases as well. And there's gonna be this sweet spot, which we're in right now, but people can't quite travel yet, where capacity will begin to increase again. There'll be big swathes of award seats available, and there's gonna be loads of ways to be able to use your points. And really popular routes, I mean, these are places, for example, somewhere like Cape Town, South Africa, somewhere that you actually can't go now from the UK. but as you would expect, Mars availability is, is wide open. You can book tickets, but also to many other places, the Caribbean, to certain places where you can go at the moment. Barbados, for example, I'm seeing quite wide open availability and people are genuinely considering going to Barbados for a few months over the winter if they can find a decent Airbnb and staying there. So there are some really great options and I think we can expect that to stay and travel is going to crank up rather relatively slowly, I think, as people emerge from lockdowns. And so there's massive opportunity there for some incredible redemptions. And I saw there, there's some really interesting schemes running around. You mentioned Barbados. Uh, they've got this uh, welcome visitor scheme at the moment where people can go and live there for, for 12 months, sort of a digital nomad type thing where uh, everybody uh, gets uh, no income tax if they go and base themselves there. So maybe there's an opportunity for that. Um, uh, Linda, I was gonna ask you, I mean, you know, and Nicky, you know, he's on, you know, got his finger on the pulse of you know, people who are sort of frequent travellers and, you know, are desperate to get these points. Um, what is it about these schemes that, that make make people desperate to do things, you know, and, and massively change their behaviour? I mean, as a psychologist, do you have any thoughts on why we're all sort of addicted to these schemes? 
<laughs> well, it's very clever. Um, it, it, the thing is that our cortex, which is the front part of our brain, and that's bigger in us uh, compared to the rest of our brain than it is in any other creature. And uh, the cortex is all about planning. I alluded to that earlier, uh, predicting, making sense. And um, it's very clever to have these points because it gives you a plan, even if you don't get to have the control and do it right then. So that that's smart. Um, it's um, a goal in itself to have X thousand points. I didn't realize you could get them from all these other things that aren't travel. So that's really interesting because then you have something that feels like A, a certainty, and uh, be a thing, you know, we're, we're deprived of, of, of opportunities of, of acquiring anything really right now. So there it is, uh, it's, you can't see it or touch it, but there it is in front of you. It's, it's very helpful, I think, for keeping motivation going when that's one of the things that drops when you are in an, a, a, a level of uncertainty that we're in motivation just melts away because you haven't got the energy for it. I mean, I certainly noticed, um, I mean, at the beginning of the pandemic, I found, you know, creativity was really an issue. And I've talked to lots of, you know, writers and artists as well. And a lot of them said that, you know, they, they lost their muse where, you know, when we first went into lockdown and, uh, um, you know, I'm not saying I'm an artist or anything, but, um, you know, whereas others use it as an opportunity to, to actually be re really, really creative. It seemed to really polarize people, I think. I don't know. Is that, is think, that a normal thing now? Yeah, I think it probably has. And it's easy to, um, to, to use your creativity when your job is more certain. So it, I think one of the factors that sifts people out is how threatened you feel about your livelihood and about whether you're going to be able to eat and do the things that you would hope to do in your career. So I think that's one thing that sifts things out. The initial th uh, feeling was that we didn't have any energy for creativity because as I said, when we go into shock, all we do is try to survive and help other humans because humans as a species are really quite pathetic and we need each other in order to be strong. Um, and uh, you know, we're not elephants or, <laughs> you know, we haven't got that kind of power. We don't have the ability without others. Um, so then though, you're right. Either people began to worry, and as I said, that has a lot to do with the, the predictability of their job and the threat to their job. It also has to do with your personality. Our personality, uh, there's one particular of the big five personality factors called neuroticism, which the, the big five are not totally genetic because nothing is uh, in psychology, but they're more heavily genetic. And the tendency to worry and to see the dark side um, is stronger in some people than others. So that will be another factor. Another one of those factors in personality is openness to new experience. And people are high on that, love to travel, love new ideas, um, and love creativity. So they're probably the ones that triggered the creativity. So you've got your own factors that are both financial and personality that I think colors that. Um, Patrick, I just wanted to come to you. I mean, you know, everyone's talking now about, do you think that travel is gonna come back to the levels that we saw before? And I just wanted to you know, from talking to your clients, are they, are they planning a return to normal after this is all over or, or are they thinking actually it's gonna be less than it was? I think that there, there is planning for it coming back, but not for a, not for a while. In terms of anyone that um, that we're talking to, um, for a spend as in a year ago would be sort of beginning of 2022. Um, seems to be the sort of common consensus. Um, but there is definitely an uptick we can see going into into the beginning of next year. So. Um, I think it depends a little bit on where they are in their, in, in their situation. If you take a look at you know, New Zealand, where I'm from, they've got a challenge of how do we let people in when we've got a population that we don't have community spread. So they've got a unique scenario there. I've, I've got um, a close friend who's a hotelier who's got very high occupancy at the moment. So there's all these sort of weird sort of um, conditions. But we're definitely seeing people preparing a more solid 2021 um, focus more around summer and more around domestic. So international seems to be the great big question mark that's hanging over everyone, um, but certainly far more of an emphasis on, um, on domestic. And 
starting to figure out for, for some of our clients, that's a new marketplace for them. You know, they have traditionally been built around international travel and they're having to completely re-gear it. So it's how do they profile those people? How do they get hold of those people? How do they build a fan base? Um, and so that seems to be where a lot of the efforts and the shift is going, moving their audience base heavily domestically focused. And, and as I said, March, um, there seems to be a significant ramp up and then really focused on, um, on the summertime period next year. And Nikki, um, you know, from talking to your readers and people in the industry, what, what do you think about travel coming back and, and also particularly about business travel? Because obviously a lot of your, your readers are in that sector, um, you know, because we've all got used to using Zoom as we're doing today. Um, <clears throat> will, will that all come back after this is over? It's, it's, a, it's the million dollar question. I think the more I speak to people, the more I get the answers at two ends of the spectrum where you get people who are saying, why would we ever pay for our employees to be flying around the globe again, staying in hotels? It's very expensive to make people do that when they could be sitting in their office or sitting at home on a Zoom call and reach the same end goal or same effect. On the flip side, and I feel very strongly this way because I'm somebody who I'm, I'm extroverted in my nature and being around people brings out creativity in me and brings out the best of me. You, For me, you cannot be being in a room with someone. If you're trying to close a deal, if you're trying to be creative, being with people physically in the same place is unmatched in my opinion but that's not everybody's opinion. So I think you're going to get a split. You'll see a lot of companies who will, will start to invest again once it's safe again to start sending employees around the world. That's the big thing. Nobody, whether you believe in it or not, I think employers are not going to take a risk on, on, on sending their employees around the world. So once that becomes safe again, it then becomes a cost and benefit consideration. And do you really believe in the value of people being together? And that's going to divide people. You're going to get very cost conscious businesses who are not going to want to do it. And other businesses that are much more creative led that are that really see the value in it. So I'm not sure I can imagine business travel being exactly where it was 12 months ago in 12 or 24 months time. But I'm sure there's going to be a bounce back. What I'm sure of, there's not going to be this flat line of we can do this all on Zoom now. We're never going to move around the world again for business. That, that is something that I don't anticipate at all. Um, and there's also likely to be some kind of bounce back effect once we can really get going again. And this applies both to personal and business travel where we feel we need to take advantage of our new freedom and do this stuff because we can do it now. And you, you know, we might see people taking those big trips. I'm finally gonna do Machu Picchu or whatever it is, or I'm gonna hop on a plane to try and close a deal when I might have considered it less because it makes a bigger impact now after having not had that for a year. So um, apologies for a sort of wishy-washy answer, but it's it's definitely in two different uh, sides. Can, can yeah, I- Linda, add, I was gonna yeah. ask you exactly on that. Yeah, because Nikki, so he put his finger on it. Um, extroversion is one of, it's the third of, of these five personality traits. And um, extroversion is really interesting, actually, Nikki. We, we think of it as something where extroverts are full of uh, sort of energy and arousal and getting out and doing things, but actually they're searching for it. They don't have enough uh, basic chemical arousal. And so extroverts need other people, need new experiences, need pressure, need deadlines uh, in order to perform at their best. Introverts, which is about a third of us, um, hi, um, uh, are uh, already overloaded with this arousal. So it's very painful to have too much stimulation. So they pull back. So I'm wondering if one of the things that maybe companies should be doing henceforward is profiling their employees because some, the extroverts will really benefit from getting out and uh, interacting directly and having new challenging experiences more than the introverts who might like the Zoom and feel that that gives them a chance to reflect and then come up with their ideas more in line with the way they are. That's the hardest of the five to change, those of the five personality characteristics, extroversion, introversion. Um, Linda, I was going to ask you um, about um, short haul and long haul travel, you know, so um, I, I know you're not a travel expert necessarily, but no. um, do you think, um, you know, to Nikki's point, 
um, will we be wanting to sort of, you know, do, splash out on this, you know, trip of a lifetime because we haven't been able to do it for, for a year? Or, or will we actually say, OK, I'm just going to go away for the weekend because I like travel? Two things are going on there because both of them will help uh, an individual. Um, psychologists know that the minimum time you need to really get a refocus, to really feel you've benefited from uh, a change is four nights. I, I don't know why, but the research shows that you need at least that. So you need a long weekend. So a lot of people have realizing that just a little bit of change really will help them now that they know what it's like not to get any, will maybe take more short holidays. But a lot of people are also going to realize just what Nikki said that, you know, how unpredictable life is. And, you know, there's no promise this will never happen again. Maybe I better live for now a little bit more. And I'm going to do the things that I'd always dreamed of. Uh, obviously, finance is permitting. So I think you'll get both uh, a sprinkling of both and could both of those can be capitalized on by the industry. Um, Patrick, <clears throat> I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that. So do, do you see in your data the way that people are ch changing their habits and searching, you know, are they looking at short haul trips? Are they looking at long haul trips? Is, is that sort of evident in what you're looking at? Well, it's funny. We've seen it in a number of different ways. So definitely more short haul than long haul um, and, and, and trying to figure out when long haul will be appropriate. So as an example, you know, you have weddings all on backlogs, you have major birthday celebration, all of those sorts of things are accumulated. So people, um, there's been a lot more on um, when markets are going to reopen uh, and, and, and the various quarantine rules. But we've actually been doing an interesting one for an uh, automotive manufacturer um, about are um, more people going to be buying cars to do short haul travel, for instance, because they don't want to go on an Uber, they don't want to go you know, necessarily on a train or whatever it is. So it spills into a lot of different areas. And in fact, you know, we, we've seen um, we've seen from the travel side of things a lot more questions about the human um, people looking up, um, so, you know, whether it's seating beside each other on planes. Um, what is the capacity of the plane? All sorts of weird things like that that we wouldn't have seen before. So it spills into a lot of different areas. Um, the automotive one was quite interesting, that the car rental versus car sharing versus car buying, because it was ultimately a spillover of the travel, the travel issue. Um, <clears throat> Nikki, uh, um, you know, obviously travel companies are going to have to do a lot to encourage people back to travel again. I mean, I know we've, we've talked about the pent up demand there, but uh, you know, we've got an interesting uh, discussion tomorrow about reputation management and the cruise and ski sectors, you know, which were very closely tied to the uh, the start of the pandemic. And you know, how how are those organisations going to get people? Um, going on a cruise holiday or on a ski holiday again, given that. And, and I just wonder about the, you know, the loyalty points um, element of that and pricing and things like that. So are they going to have to deep discount or offer, you know, incredible deals to, to get people traveling again? I think discounting and deals is almost inevitable in many places in the market. That's what's going to entice people. And, and the prices are going to drive each other down. It's, it's, it's sort of unavoidable. But there will be places where that won't happen. It's interesting. Um, you mentioned, you, you said before, I'm in Santorini and I found out that the place that I'm staying now had full occupancy throughout the entire summer. And um, Santorini kind of experienced that Greece was pretty much open over the summer and they didn't need to discount anywhere. Rooms were selling for what they were selling for last summer. So you're going to see pockets of, there'll be, no, there'll be just no need to do things like that. Interesting ski resorts and cruising. Um, so much focus has been on those. We write a lot about both of those things at the points guy and, and because there's been so much craziness really. Um, but those are the places, maybe more so cruise ships where there's been a big focus on safety, the airlines as well. When I say safety, I mean COVID safety. And if there's no vaccine and we still have to be very careful about uh, reducing transmission, it's going to be the companies that both are able to offer the deals, but are able to really sell themselves on being incredibly clean, incredibly safe, for the airlines, for example, in the US, there's a big focus on are they are airlines going to block middle seats? And many of them have, and many of them have said they can't afford to continue doing that. But it's almost the equivalent of a discount, an airline saying, we're going to block the seat next to you um, but, and when you buy your ticket. Uh, and, and, the, and the airlines that have said, we're going to throw people off the plane if you're not wearing a mask. It's not, it's not really about 
that one person not wearing the mask on that flight. It's about, I'm buying a Delta ticket and I know everyone on that flight will be wearing a mask because they're going to get rid of everybody who isn't. So whatever the company, the companies are going to have to do lots to um, instill confidence in passengers and prospective customers, uh, both in terms of COVID safety, um, but also they're going to have to, that there's also just going to have to be discounts. We're human after all, you know, everybody loves a deal. There's nobody who doesn't. And Patrick, I, d I just wanted to talk to you about, um, you know, marketing personas, because of often, you know, that's how uh, companies in all sectors will will sort of segment, you know, how they, they they try to win their customers. And, and I just wondered if, if you think that, you know, that's going to change very much about what what those personas are going to be. Are we going to be able to have those broad personas anymore? I mean, I know you sort of talked about this sort of micro targeting and, mm -hmm. uh, and then maybe um, we can sort of move on and with Linda as well, talking about, you know, what, what specific uh, things that people can be looking for? Are they going to be looking for, you know, cleanliness as, as Nikki talked about there, are they going to be looking for isolation, you know, and not package holidays, for example, where you're, you know, th three centimeters away from the next person on the, on the beach. So Patrick, how, how are they going to do that uh, initially? Well, I, I think there has been a shift going on anyway in the marketplace from sort of fairly broad demographic targeting. So, you know, you buy a segment of traveler users and you target them. Well, the challenge is that whoever you're buying that from, you're not too sure of how old that data is. And, and of course, everyone on the school knows that the behavior has changed. And so um, suddenly those sorts of questions become a challenge. The other one is when you have a marketplace that is just wanting to travel for their own personal reasons, be it weddings, be it family catch-ups, whatever, some of the age brackets go out the window. And so ultimately the old sort of broad demographic targeting hits major issues. And so as, as we've been going through this, it's been trying to sort of balance um, getting enough scale that you can be opportunistic um, when a market opens or conversely closes and just, just, just pivot. So get enough scale there, but focus really heavily on the interests around it that you can start to sort of piggyback from a creative standpoint, you know, what you're putting in front of them. So I mentioned before about, you know, the dining out experience that was certainly registering fairly, fairly heavily on the domestic side of things in the UK, um, that, that there was a strong correlation with that. This um, in the States, we're starting to see that um, the sports interests alongside travel are starting to creep up to the surface. People are really dying to get back to sports events. And in Asia, there seems to be more of a focus on sort of short haul international travel as opposed to long haul, but certainly getting out of, um, out of particular uh, countries. So for instance, you know, we have a, um, a fairly large office in Singapore. And uh, if you talk to anyone in Singapore at the moment, they're pretty bored from staying in that sort of geographic area for, for that length of time. And so they're all saying, well, where can I go? That's not so long that I'm going to be on a plane forever. It's on a, a reputable airline where I've got a little bit of space. And so you know, even regionally, we're seeing quite big differences where, where some are actively trying to push the boundaries and others are just sort of accepting of the here and now um, uh, with that. But, but certainly looking at the elements around travel um, is going to be crucial with all of this. And Linda, to come to you on that, I mean, I know before all this happened, there was, you know, um, a trend for authenticity that was, that was being talked about a lot in the travel sector. You know, people looking for authentic experiences, particularly, you know, among millennials, you know, who wanting to, um, you know, get back to humanity's roots, for example. I mean, do you, do you think that's something that's going to play with people going ahead? I'm not sure that, that necessarily it will. Um, I think more, I was thinking about what Nikki said about, cru well, it was your question really, cruises um, in particular. I think you have more to look at uh, the age of the people that you're uh, trying to attract because in cruises, generally it's older people and they're gonna be much more worried about their health um, until this thing is really under control. Um, but the other thing that I think is really important is um, when we're anxious, and we will be, because we haven't tried now, we haven't traveled for a while. A lot of people, some, some have, but a lot of people haven't. They're going to be extra anxious. And one of the main things people search for when they're highly anxious is do I have escape routes? And if you don't, you get really 
I don't think I'll do this. So a car is like one of the safest because in your mind, I mean, I'm not saying it is probably one of the most dangerous, but um, you, you can always take a different road. You can always turn around. Um, cruise ship, you know, in the middle of the ocean, you might not even get to port. So they're going to have to work hard on convincing people that, you know, that there will be all kinds of outlets if there's any problems. I think, I think, I'm just looking psychologically, not business, but that's my guess. And um, we had a question from the audience sort of related to that, which I, I think is quite interesting, is about um, how can the industry mitigate some of the stress around travel? Because, you know, as we all know, you know, going through an airport it can often be very stressful, particularly if you're with a family, for example. I mean, do, do you think there are things that the travel industry can do to reduce those? Yes, I do. Uh, the first thing that comes to my mind and the thing that we miss almost as much as change right now is true human contact. Um, we, we're desperate for it because it's absolutely necessary to humans for relatively longer in our life than any other creature. Again, um, we need to be with others, not virtually, really. Um, so having an agent, uh, you know, to help you through, you know, especially if whatever company you went with, if you had a, a named person that was there that got you on board or that gave you things to do while you waited, I think would be like magic right now because we are starved for that you know i think I we can... saw that yeah um, no, 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 in, in, no, sorry to well. interrupt you patrick we saw that uh, we had one of these talks a few months ago with um Kuoni, and they were talking about you know they, they were doing some virtual sessions and it was just that they had someone real to talk to and, and particularly at the beginning of the pandemic when it was all about refunds and cancellations and things like that you know p people wanted to talk to another person yep. so uh, sorry patrick you were going to say though yeah, I was actually just going to sort of um, sort of chime in on what Linda was saying as well. I mean, I've flown two airlines in the last two weeks, and they couldn't have been at other opposite ends of the spectrum for really taking into account the psychological, you know, profile of people versus not. One um, was very organised on getting on the plane, you know, scheduled everyone in groups, and you were not allowed up in there. Emptied the plane off, you know, row by row essentially, and everyone stayed in their seats until those rows went. The other was essentially the same old sort of packing on, packing off um, with a little bit of lip service around it. And I, it, it, it's funny because um, all of us noticed the absolute difference between the two and how one, you actually felt really comfortable and really assured by it and how the other sort of made a mockery of it and why on earth are, are we sort of talking about all these rules, but no one's following them. So it, it was a real life example that I've just you know, personally seen recently. And, and we're hungry, aren't we, for uh, predictability. So that airline that said, you know, what we're gonna do is this row is gonna go and this row is gonna go, that erases the effect of waiting. You don't mind at all hmm. because you have predictability, which is what we, <laughs> the other thing we've lost. Hmm. I was gonna ask you as well, Linda, I don't know, or, or anybody in fact, about, um, you know, the, the likelihood that people are gonna want more certainty. So we've had a question from the audience about the demand for, um, at all protected holidays so you know you can obviously book all these things individually and um, maybe Nikki can chime in on, on this because obviously you might be wanting to um, you know book a particular airline um, or you could book a package where everything is all done for you and, and you're sort of uh, you know, looked after the whole whole way and if anything goes wrong with it you're going to get a refund as well so so it'd be interesting to know you know linda whether people are likely to look for that sort of hand holding you know in line with what you've said or whether you know our base instinct is going to say well actually i'm going to go for the cheaper flight and get the points as well yeah i think people are going to value the experiences they have now more and i think they'll think more carefully and fit better with their personality having said that you know some people part of the whole game is the risk and that's fun. So for some people, they'll, they'd rather pay less and take a chance. And it's not so much to lose, that's okay. Uh, but I, I really do think that the pervasive tone, especially on that first trip, when, when once we're, we're feeling life is going to be okay again, uh, will be to, to value it and therefore to have it as predictable as possible, I think. Did you have any thoughts, Nikki, on that? Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts. This is something that I get asked about an incredible amount and that we talk about an incredible amount. So 
I feel like with everything I'm saying, there's two massive different ends of the spectrum here. So let's talk about package holidays. Now, the idea of a package holiday in, in today's world sounds more appealing because you just have to deal with one person. They can sort everything out for you. APTA or ATOL protection, depending on what type of trip you've got, means that should the company go bust, um, your, your money, you're not going to lose your money. Or if you're abroad already and the company goes bust, you're not going to lose your money. But where it may come to be a little bit more difficult, firstly, confidence in travel companies and travel agents has, has dampened a little bit because people have watched the experience of, of travel agents that have gone bust. And it's and whilst Abter and Atoll are protecting you in the end financially, or if you're on holiday already, there is a, a bit of nervous energy there around these companies which feel at risk. That being said, what hotel company or airline or travel company isn't at risk now? So, so there's always risk there. Um, so there's some comfort in booking everything in one place, but also having, we've always said, having direct relationships. So booking directly with an airline or directly with a hotel can often benefit you because it means you get a bit more flexibility, changing's easier. Um, and, and there's a bit more certainty there, even if there's slightly more work to do. Now with booking any trip, what we've been advising people is make sure you are fully protected. So if you're booking with a with an airline, make sure you have comprehensive travel insurance that's going to cover you in every eventuality. Make sure you're booking on a credit card. So if the airline does go bust, you'll be protected by legislation in the UK to get your to get your money back. Um, make sure that whoever you book with is fully flexible, or you can cancel most almost all the airlines now. You can change or cancel your ticket almost without limit. Um, so there's lots of options there, lots of flexibility if you want to go for it yourself. Um, so it, it's a it's a toss up. But I think you may see more people um, who maybe traditionally would have just gone to a package holiday operator, maybe not doing that this time around um, and finding better bargains with the added flexibility and confidence that you have that relationship directly with BA or Virgin or EasyJet or whoever it is. I just had a quick question as well. I, I just saw the other day that American Airlines had its loyalty program valued at 30 billion dollars you know so some you know given this situation some of the loyalty programs are actually bigger now than the the airlines that um that created them in the first place and what, what what does that mean for the um you know the solvency of those airlines not not american particularly but what does that mean well if we talk about u.s airlines it means absolutely everything for their solvency literally they've they've put up their loyalty programs as collateral for the cash injections that they've had I and mean, actually if you look at the numbers different different outlets report slightly different numbers but um you're looking at united's program which was valued at about 22 billion dollars but united itself only valued at 10 billion i think american you mentioned was about 30 billion the advantage program was uh was uh, valued at but american itself is somewhere between six and seven billion so the disparity between what the airline is worth and what its loyalty program is worth is crazy and they and they are that's where they that's where they're making their money and they're shoring up their finances through that method and, and really that's it's it all came out of the u.s where um, it became incredibly lucrative for these programs to sell the points to mainly credit card issuers who who have much more unrestricted um, amounts that they can charge retailers. And whereas in the UK, we have a cap on what credit card issuers can charge retailers. In the US, it's unrestricted. So they charge way more, but they offer way more to customers shelling out miles left, right and center, and they have to buy those from the airlines. So it's been it's been an amazing moneymaker. And actually, right now, you could almost say that with some of the airlines, it's kept them, it's literally kept them afloat. Now, Patrick, um, you know, we, we talked um, a little bit about what marketing people are looking at. I mean, we, you know, obviously, you know, we've gone very digital during the pandemic. Is, is that going to be a permanent shift of marketing money, would you say? You know, it's obviously been going on for some time anyway. And we've seen the rise, of, you know, the likes of Amazon outside of the sector. And, um, you know, some of the companies that have done particularly well have been digital first in this. But, you know, should marketers now think, actually, most of my money should be going into, into digital? Right now, yes, because it allows them to pivot fastest. So I think there is digital and then there is within digital. You know, if you break it down into the three different silos of social, um, search, and, and sort of broader programmatic outside of that, I think there has been where it has all been about sort of um, biddable media and just the transaction of it. Now it's starting to recognize that a lot of the structures and tactics that have been used in the past, particularly in the social and search world, 
might be um, sort of stalled um, because just the situations have changed and, and what people are doing has changed. Um, so I think one is, is that. The other is that um, there has been a bit of a move from just the transaction of the digital to actually, okay, how can I take any of that feedback loop I'm getting out of that world and apply it outside of it? So whether it's um, point of sale or whether it's through their, um, their email messaging that they're doing, whatever it might be, but it's, it's sort of maintaining the fluidity and the feedback loop that you're getting from the digital arena and, and taking any little morsel you can and amplifying it anywhere you can. So I think that the move to digital was always happening um, and was always accelerating, but it's actually just trying to create as much of a feedback loop as possible that you can actually capitalize on it wherever it may be. Um, we've only got um, a few minutes left. Uh, I just sort of really wanted to sort of finish on a piece of advice from from each of you when we're sort of like looking ahead to, you know, when the pandemic is over, you know, for your particular audiences, whether it's, you know, businesses in your case, Patrick, or or travel, frequent travellers in your case, Nikki, or, or just all of us in your case, uh, Linda, um, about how, you know, what we should be doing to prepare for that return uh, of travel. I know Linda particularly, I mean, I know we talked before about, you um, and what you could do at home um, in advance of uh, being able to travel, you know, maybe uh, recreating the travel experience at home. Maybe, maybe you could start talking about that. And, and generally, any other thoughts about how to prepare ourselves psychologically? I think, well, let, me, let me start with how, how everybody can prepare themselves psychologically, which is, uh, is to prioritize rest, especially in the winter, uh, because we'll be more logical, and to set little goals every day so that when the goals can be bigger, you're already used to planning again, because otherwise it'll all feel overwhelming. But in the summer, well, no, in June, May, June, when we really weren't sure what was gonna happen, uh, I was writing a lot about how can you have a holiday anyway? And there were some great um, clips on YouTube and places like that of people uh, having, a, a, having a staycation that worked in those three things I talked about earlier, new habits, a change, and feeling control. And what they did was they said, for example, I remember one guy, one family said, uh, let's, uh, let's have our Spain holiday anyway, our Spanish holiday anyway. So the, they bought a Spanish cookbook and ordered in ingredients. So they only had Spanish food. They had it at the times of day they would have had on holiday. I know this is gonna be harder in the winter, but um, they wore the clothes they would have worn on the holiday. When you think what you're saving on the holiday, you could turn your heat up for a couple of days. Um, one guy even made a great big sun, uh, you know, a, a, a yellow sun and pasted it on the wall and used bright lighting. You can do all kinds of things to uh, pretend you're on holiday. There were some hilarious like paddling pools that were our, this is our swimming pool. And, you know, the more you laugh, the more you release tension. It's better than a good cry. I don't know if people know that, but you actually release more tension in laughing than in a good cry. So make it a joke. Uh, have a staycation wherever you want. Uh, it'll also prepare you for when you can really do it because you'll be so ready to appreciate the stuff that you tried to make happen yourself. Um, Patrick, what about, what about uh, businesses, travel businesses who need to think about marketing? How are they going you know, to emerge from this? What, what are your, what's your tip for them? I think build uh, adaptability and flexibility into everything. If, if you're looking, if, if you've got partners and you're getting a sort of a status quo and a similar profile to last year, challenge it. I mean, it's it's... Anyone who is going down the path of, of thinking it's going to be the same, it, it's not. And so it, it's go and, and, and work with your partners and, and find out how you can inject better feedback, more adaptability, more flexibility, and how you can build a, a, um, a rhythm of working together that you can pivot on the dime. So there isn't a great bureaucratic decision-making process. You know, if, if a market suddenly reopens, and you can see that there is demand there because that's critical. You know, you, you need to be able to see demand in real time. So if you can see demand that there is a real time, capitalize on it fast, be ready to have creative that can move quickly. Um, so it's, it's building that uh, adaptability and flexibility into the DNA and ensuring that that is sort of one of your critical differences. And Nikki, uh, finally from you, just um, how should we be preparing for this? Should we be you know, putting all of our um, Amazon and ASOS deliveries on credit cards to rack up those points. Uh, and do you have any other advice? 
Absolutely. Always use it. Always earn rewards everywhere, every turn, every opportunity. I want to draw on just two words that are ringing out. One, one from, well, I'll start with Linda. Dreaming is like, since you first said that at the beginning, that's kind of been ringing around in my head. And I think it's incredibly important. So I would advise when, when, um, when the country opens up a little bit more or places you're able to go places like we saw in the summer, take advantage, go on a staycation, go on a short European easy break, keep it simple um, to somewhere that you can go to and, and, and enjoy it and have it and have that break. But dream big. So think about what's going to happen far down the line. What's that dream trip and start to build towards that. And you can start racking up points and miles and all the rest of it to actually achieve that thing. And it might be next year but, and it might be the year after, but I think having that end goal of, of, of something. So dreaming, that's the important thing. And then just drawing on something Patrick said from a business perspective, you were talking about flexibility, but from a passenger perspective, just make sure that everything you're doing is flexible, both in terms of um, changing tickets or being able to get your money back. And so I think, both the combination of saving all your miles, earning lots and lots for that big dream trip, um, taking a short break, uh, but also being incredibly flexible so that you can't actually lose out amongst all of this is, is the way forward for me. Well, that's all we have time for today, unfortunately. And um, I, it's great that there's so much positivity on this and that we are going to get out of this. Um, I'd like to say a heartfelt thanks to my panelists today, psychologist Linda Blair, Patrick Johnson of Hybrid Theory and Nikki Kelvin of the Point Sky UK uh, for sharing their time and expertise on this on how we move from missing travel so terribly into actually doing it again. And um, I think just for me, I, I, I think we know that the travel industry is, is resilient and creative. And I know that if anyone can come back from this, it is the smart and stoic people of travel. So um, I wish you all the very best at this challenging time. So thank you, everybody. Bye. <laughs>